speakers. Hello, hello. Got a few more coming. Great, have a seat. all of you. So you're back in school. It's finally happened. You're back in school. And I know that the last couple of weeks during our chats, we've had some time to talk about school. And so I'm going to pick up on it one more time. Because school is one of those places where not only do we learn things about numbers and reading and other things, history and all of that, but we also learn some things also about how to behave in a good way, all right? And, and most of that happens because you're taking all of those good things that your parents have taught you about how to be kind and caring, and you take all of those into school and you learn that there are other people who have those same kind of opinions and feelings about it. So, imagine this, and I know that you've probably already done that. How many of you have stood in line already in school? Stood in a long line, okay? Maybe for lunch, okay? Maybe for something else to go outside. Oh, here, come on in. We got, we got time, we got time. You, you just came in right under the wire. Perfect, all right. Hi there. You can come over and see Sissy, there you go. Okay, so we're talking about lines, getting in line. When somebody says, whether it's the teacher or somebody out in the playground says, it's time to do something and you have to get in the line. Be honest, tell me the truth, okay? How many of you push and shove to get to the front of the line? Be honest. Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. Do you do that for us? Right. Well, sometimes you do. Yeah, okay, well, let's be, let's be real truthful about it because the if we know there's something really good in the front of the line and we want to get to it first, we do that, don't we? Yeah, because we're eager and we're excited and we want to see what's going on. Well, unfortunately, there's got to be somebody who has to be in the middle and in the, in the back of the line, right? Absolutely. So Jesus says that if we're pushing into, to the front of the line, to get something first before someone else or to make sure that we get what belongs to us, then that maybe that's not such a great idea, okay? Yeah, that's right. And so what we do is we say that the loving thing and the thing that Jesus wants us to do is to let people go ahead of us and, and believe that what our place in that line is going to be respected and cared for, and if we're invited to come to the front of the line, that's a whole different story. But if we assume, you know what assume means? If we think that we already know that it's the right place to be in the front of the line, we might discover that somebody will say, you need to go to the back of the line, okay? And then we feel bad, don't we? Okay, yeah. So we let some others go ahead of us, and then maybe somebody says, well, come on up. You can be in the front of the line this time. Everybody else has had a chance and you get to do that too, okay? So, Jesus says the first will be last and the last will be first. And it's all about how we are loving to each other and allowing other people to have as much of a chance as we have to be placed in the right spot in the line, okay? Wonderful. I know you're gonna have fun with the rest of the school year, and I'm so delighted to see you, all you good active learners. So, all, with all of that in mind, let's fold our hands, let's bow our heads, and let's talk to Jesus today, okay? Thank you, Jesus, for being generous to us. Thank you for making us your friends. Thank you for helping us to understand that as you love us, we're also supposed to love other people, and help us to be content when we're not in the front of the line, that you still know that we're there and that you love us. Amen. Thank you. Have a seat. See you later. And have a good day off tomorrow. Have fun. Okay. And there you go. Off with Miss Luann. Indeed. Thank you.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, it is not always a spoken rule, maybe one that's given tacit attention. It certainly isn't always a documented rule. But there is, I, I think, within our social circles, a certain understanding that to give and to receive hospitality, in polite society, you sort of need to know and to be known. You get my drift? Familiarity, maybe, is a better word to use. Some familial or collegial connections that open doors easily for both the host and the guest. But what if you are in need of hospitality and you are a complete stranger? How do you plead your own case? when you are in a vulnerable situation and in real need of an open door and access to safety. Now let's let that question sort of dangle while I tell you a personal story. Once upon a time, there were four friends, two couples. These friends had planned a bicycling tour of the California Coastal Highway. Now, this was a while back, okay, when Pastor Connie was much younger and more able to do those sorts of things. Pastor Tim as well. Two of the four, the husbands, had begun this adventure one week prior to meeting the other two, the wives, in San Francisco. And the husbands had already bicycled the length of the coastal highway from Astoria, Oregon, to a point just north of the Bay Area. Mark and Lisa were our friends and we shared a passion for long distance cycling. To say that our itinerary was ambitious would be to grossly understate the case. Having picked up the men about 40 minutes north of San Francisco, we drove to a hotel near the Embarcadero we unloaded the bikes and the panniers, and we settled in for a couple of days in San Francisco of sightseeing before we continued the journey, which was planned to take us over a course of a week's time from San Francisco to Los Angeles. That was our final destination. Now, I guess maybe the reason I'm thinking about this story is because all of this transpired during Labor Day weekend back in the day. And it was Saturday of the Labor Day weekend. The plan was to drop off the rental car to take the BART. Any of you know about the BART? The Bay Area Regional Transit, which is the train all the way around the city. We were to take the BART south to Daly City and then ride for about 30 miles to the Half Moon Bay campground where we had reserved a tent camping site. And really, 30 miles is an easy distance for experienced cyclists, and we were experienced cyclists. And even a later checkout from the hotel, which is what we made arrangements for, a noon checkout, would still have placed us at our destination comfortably, comfortably at around 7 p.m. But our good friends wasted time. And there's really no nice way to say that other than just simply to say that, okay? And when you're traveling as a group, you are dependent upon everybody's timeliness. We were ready by noon. Noon became one o'clock. One o'clock became 1.45 when Mark and Lisa finally strolled leisurely back into the hotel lobby, having turned in the rental car. And so then we were off to the BART and Daly City on the bikes, finally, 
fighting Labor Day traffic, making a wrong turn after we had already breezed down a hill so that we had to ride back up the hill to correct the mistake, miscue after miscue. And by the time that it was 6 p.m., we still had not gotten far enough out of the metro area to put in some serious writing to get to the campground. The sun was beginning to set. The fog was beginning to roll in. We were hungry. And we tried our level best to find a hotel room, but everything, of course, was booked on Labor Day weekend. The only option was, or at least seemed to be, sitting up all night on the curb in front of a convenience store. And I will take credit where credit is due. Sometimes you have to do that. I got the bright idea that maybe we ought to call a church. Right? Makes sense, doesn't it? It's got to be a church somewhere within a quick ride that would give us shelter for the night. And so we went, and I know this is going to sound so antiquated, and I know some of you will understand exactly what I mean. We went to the payphone. <laughs> where there was an intact phone book, not wrecked to shreds. We went to the payphone with the phone book, and wouldn't you know, there was a Lutheran church about five or six miles away from where we were. Hot dog. But is anyone even there? That became the question. So, drop a quarter in the payphone and dial the church number. One ring, two rings, three rings, four rings. And just as it began to ring the fifth time, a gentleman picked up the phone. Turned out it was the pastor who was there late on Saturday night running the Sunday bulletins. So I told him who we were, that there were four of us, and that three of us were ELCA pastors. And I said, you can look it up in the ELCA yearbook. And by golly, he did. <laughs> he checked the veracity of our story after we had given him some facts to check against. And so then he gave us directions as to how to get to the church. And so we very quickly bought a couple of cans of something. I think it was Hormel chili. Threw them in the panniers, okay? I know you're all saying, ew, okay? But when you're hungry, anything goes, right? Okay. Threw them in the panniers and rode to Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Pacifica, California, where we slept on the floor and we ate that microwave Hormel chili. We worshiped with God's people at Holy Cross the next day, and everyone, honestly, everyone was so incredibly kind to us, and before we left, they gathered around us in a circle, and they prayed for us, and then they handed us batches of cookies and pastries to stuff in all of our belongings, for just a little something for the journey. Now we were strangers to these people, and yet we weren't. And that's maybe one of my points today. We were, but we weren't. We had information, of course, to back up our crazy story. And the whole episode has truly given me 20 plus years to reflect and to think about what, what might have happened to us had we no ability to assure the pastor that we were honest people with a legitimate need. The writer of Hebrews gives the early Christians guidelines about what it means to live into the call of the Holy Spirit. Do not neglect to show hospitality, the writer says, for by doing so, some have 
entertained angels without knowing it. Now, trust me, we did not look like angels. <laughs> when we came to that church, we were tired and frustrated and sweaty, and yet they took us in. But we had this much in common with those who were our hosts. All of us were on a journey, a journey of faith. For Christians, the whole of life is a sojourn. There is nothing at all fixed or permanent for us in this world. Let that seep into your psyche for just a minute. Nothing fixed or permanent in this world. Our own generous hearts are always involved in a mutual give and share way of being in this life. As to the identity of the stranger in our midst, the fact is we are all strangers and sojourners to somebody or to some community. While it may seem simplistic, it all really depends on who is the one who stands outside the threshold and who stands inside. Because we've all stood in both places. And it is entirely legitimate to reflect on both positions and recognize that there is a high degree of vulnerability, whether you're on the outside looking in or whether you're on the inside looking out. The one who stands at the door seeking a safe place and shelter is certainly vulnerable. So too, the one who reflects upon the possibility of offering safety and shelter. So there really is no way we can know about the unknown angels in our midst. They don't come with credentials. They aren't on the A-list. They don't look like angels, as we have imagined angels to look. Their names are not written in the social register in some fashion to be confirmed in terms of their identity. More often than not, they come with a story of how they've arrived, where they're going, what got in the way of their personal travelogue. And there is vulnerability plenty of it, in both the telling and in the hearing. The list of unknowns is infinitely larger than the few things that we do know, but what we do know may be compelling enough. We know that we are people of the cross. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. That makes baptism something much bigger than just simply something that we do here in church, a ritual action. It means that what we do, and it means that what we say, is always filtered through Christ's death and resurrection, and through Christ's invitation to us to follow in his pathway. And in truth, death empties us of all that we believe ourselves to be as the world defines us. Resurrection is always the promise that death is not the end, but a beginning. Of these promises, we can be sure because Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, is the evidence of that truth. Okay, so how does that all play in Peoria? Hardly a week goes by here at Advent, or any congregation, I might add, where someone does not stop and ask for some sort of help. And I have a decision to make. And so I have to sit with that decision and have to make the best call that I know how to make. Is this someone who really needs help? And you know, I have to tell you, in all honesty, even after I have made a decision, those decisions haunt me for days afterwards. Was I right? Did I do the right thing? Was my yes the right answer? Or should I have said no? Tough work. And if you've been in that situation, you know how tough it is. 
If we make these and other choices with a spirit of uneasiness, hear what I'm saying, if we make those choices in a spirit of uneasiness, if our decisions begin and end with this question, what if I was in that place and what if it was me, then your uh, uneasiness as a follower of Jesus ironically is a blessing. If you are experiencing the squirm factor in those hard, hard decisions, bless your uneasiness, Doug Hammarskjöld says, because it is a sign that there is still life in you. We can try to clean up the biblical worldview and say that as the writer of Hebrews was writing what he did, that it was a different time and people were perhaps more trustworthy, but you know what? Human nature is still human nature. It is not time or culturally specific. And in the end, the essential message of the gospel is this, that God through Christ took the risk to inhabit a broken world, did so among a broken people, was himself broken because of human sin and human will, died and then showed humankind that death wasn't the end, but the beginning of a new way of living. Is it risky? Oh yes, you bet. Maybe the starting point for radical hospitality is not at all radical. Maybe we start by praying that God will grant us the courage to take small steps, first steps, such as steps of generosity, small steps, compassion, finding ways to support and to assist in small ways, creating space in our hearts for the stranger rather than somehow clothing ourselves in a posture that assumes the absolute worst. You see, radical hospitality is really not radical. It's the gospel. It's rooted in love. Love that we have first received so that then we can give love. And the only person you really need to know to give love and to receive it is Jesus Christ. Amen.